Good morning. How is everybody doing? Okay, that was pretty weak. How is everybody doing? All right, very good. I know it, it's never easy to make a presentation when you know you're standing between you, know, you and the lunch, uh, which is going to be served after this, right? But I'm going to try to make it as exciting and interesting as possible. My name is Soji Scaria. I'm the uh, head of uh, Sesame uh, for global software and R&D. Uh, I've been in the technology field for the last 27 years, um, especially in the last eight years working on digital transactions and cash transactions. So I'm here today to talk about a few things. Um, basically, the agenda is you know, trying to find out how relevant is cash in our economy. Uh, let, me give you, let me start with some of the statistics that we see in the past few years. In the last few years, I'm sure you all agree with me uh, we've seen a rise in the digital transactions, right? I mean, really fueled by the pandemic. Everybody wants to go contactless, touchless. So a rise in the digital transactions. But, you know, the, the central governments in, in many countries in the past few months have done studies that show that the cash levels have actually risen back to the pre-pandemic levels in all of the geographies. Okay? And in fact, in some of the geographies, even more than the pre-pandemic levels. So really, does cash remain the most democratic and inclusive form of payment? And if yes, then how do we integrate cash into the digital ecosystem, right? And is that whole evolution, what is the whole evolution in the industry? So those are the questions that we're going to try to solve in the next 30 minutes. Let me start with some global trends and let's look at a video. Wake up. What do you see? Money everywhere. And everybody chasing money. Selling time and effort to get money. Money moves the world. It always has. Money is past, present, and future. Money with different forms and values. Some even say it's close to extinction. But you know what? Even in digital times, the world needs cash to keep moving. It's the one language the whole world speaks. First choice when everything else fails. The last reward when everything goes well. Cash in an unstoppable cycle. The cash someone spends, somebody earns. The cash somebody gets, someone else pays. It's not a matter of taste, but a matter of facts. The world needs cash to keep moving. Okay, let's look at some global trends. Actually, you know what, before I go to the global trends, I would like to actually do a trend of cash in this room. Uh, I know you've been sitting down here since 8.30 this morning. Uh, I'm gonna do some exercise. Sorry, I'm not gonna make you do some high intensity workout here. Uh, but if you could, you know, reach out into your purse or wallet and just open your purses and wallets. And by show of hands, tell me, how many of you are carrying cash with you today? Wow, majority, almost 100% of you. Now, I, I know, I mean, I'll open my, I mean, if I see in my wallet, I carry cash as well. But you and I, we all are used to digital transactions, you know, transacting in credit cards and debit cards and wallet transactions and bitcoins and all kinds of currencies, right? But we all carry cash with us. And we're gonna try to find out why do we all carry cash with us. So some of the interesting metrics that you see here, uh, the Federal Reserve did a study uh, actually earlier this year in North America, especially in the US, and found that the cash transactions have gone up in 2020 and 2021 by 1%. A small increase, but really 20% of all payments in the United States are done by cash. Latin America, it's actually even more. It actually remains as the leading ca payment in, ca in, in transactions. Europe, actually, when you see I mean, Europe, there's a decline in cash. But when you look at certain segments of Europe um, in terms of certain transactions, like person-to-person -person transactions or a transaction for a small amount at a POS, three out of four transactions are done in cash. Middle East and Africa, again, 44% of point-of-sale transactions done in cash. Asia is actually you know, going very much digital. Uh, digital transactions have very much increased in the last few years. But again, 
almost 70% of transactions are done in cash, even at a global landscape, right? So that was from a user perspective. Now let's look at some companies. Now uh, what I've done is taken a, a small group, I mean, this is from the European Central Bank, uh, looking at companies, small businesses uh, in certain industries, like in the, um, in the food industry, in, in, in non-banking, non-financial industries, in arts, entertainment, hospitality, you see that 24% of the preferred payment method is cash. Although, I mean, you have a very much, you know, accepted digital ecosystem, but cash is still relevant, right? Cash is perceived by majority of the companies as cheaper, faster, more reliable compared to all the other methods of payment. This is from a small company perspective. And the other, you know, the aspect of the, uh, in the economy that you have to consider is the whole social inclusion. You know, across the globe today, Policies are being developed to ensure that cash is a secure payment option. Now, I don't know how many of you remember, um, Sweden had come, come up with, you know, a few years ago with a goal to be completely cash free, cashless by 2023, right? And now the latest announcement, announcement from the Swedish Federal Reserve or the Federal Bank is that we are not going to stop uh, producing notes and coins. Why is that? You know, Sweden, like most other countries, have realized that there is a small, however small, but there is a percentage, five to six percentage of people in Sweden uh, who are, you know, fall into the unbanked or underbanked population. And they need to be included in the payment ecosystem, right? So you don't want to exclude them into, from the ecosystem. Hence, you, you, you know, the uh, Sweden and all of the countries, I mean, are coming up with new mandates to include cash as a payment option. Because again, this is the most safest, stable, and fairness of payment, right? And just for everybody, I mean, uh, I know we have a, a wide variety of, you know, audience here. Unbanked is our people who don't have a bank account. Right? People who don't have a bank account. Underbanked are people who have a bank account but don't avail to all the features, functionalities, digital functionalities of the bank. I mean, I was talking to my dad. I mean, he's 79 years old. You know, he grew up in an economy where, you know, they used to have, um, in fact, even in the early part of my life, uh, a passbook, not a passport, but I don't know how many of you remember a passbook. A passbook, right? Or, you know, where you go to the bank and you physically have the teller type or update your balance in a passbook. And that's what, you know, we all used to carry back in the day or even, you know, even 10, 15 years ago, right? So there are people who are unbanked or the underbanked population. So when you look at some metrics here, uh, about 8.5 million people in Canada are unbanked, either unbanked or underbanked. About 22% of the Americans are unbanked or underbanked. And ECB did a study recently, and about 13.5 million people across Europe are either unbanked or underbanked. And this number is actually increasing. You know, one of the primary reasons is that because of the global displacement of people, right? because of war and all the other things that are happening, immigration, people migrate to the West, to Canada, North America, to Western Europe, and people are migrating from countries where cash is king. So they have a certain habit, social behavior, and as they migrate to the countries, they like to carry those habits, right? So there are a lot of people that are banked, uh, you know, unbanked or underbanked people. Um, now, it's not just social inclusion. Um, it's a choice of payment for people. So really to answer the question that I asked you, why do we all carry cash in our wallet? It's because it's a choice of payment, right? So we always like to have that choice of payment. The other reason what I found is budget control. Um, now we think, you know, maybe this is for the elderly or maybe a, a different generation. So I have two kids, I have two boys, a uh, 19 year old and a 17 year old. My older son, doesn't really care. I mean, he spends as much as he wants to until the dad says, you know, uh, calls, says no. My younger one is a little bit more budget conscious. So both have a credit card. And a few months ago, my younger one comes to me saying, you know what, dad, when I spend on the credit card, I really can't manage my budget because by middle of the month, I am done with my allowance. So can you, instead of giving me a card, can you give me my allowance in cash? And I was surprised. And in the past few months, he's able to manage that budget 
you know, much better. So again, interesting fact, right? I mean, it's not about the generations. It's about, you know, certain things that people see as budget control. Can you manage budget better if you have cash? And again, you know, it's the whole cost of managing cash. As you try to drive cash out of the economy, the cost to do business in cash is going to increase. Less number of cash points, the less, the higher will be the cost per cash point, right? So every, every bank, every central bank, every uh, industry is trying to ensure that the cost of managing cash is manageable. Okay, so that's, those were all the kind of global trends. Let us look at some of the industry uh, stakeholders in this whole cash ecosystem or the digital ecosystem. I've tried to paint a very simple picture in this, you know, in this cash cycle. Uh, the banks are the banks, or the, uh, you know, the retail banks, the central banks. You see the consumers. So the central bank produces the money, uh, right, as we all know. And then, you know, it is gone. It, the, the banks, the CIT actually delivers CIT, uh, secure transportation, cash in transit companies like Garda World, uh, delivers those, the cash to the, to the bank branches, to the ATMs, to the retail stores. As consumers, we go to the ATMs or the banks, we withdraw the cash, we go to the retailers, we spend that money, CIT picks up that money from the retailers, they go and take it to the CVS or the cash processing center, they count the money, and then again goes back to the, the bank's vault and the central bank. That, and that cycle continues, right? So these are the major stakeholders in this whole cash ecosystem. So let's see what is happening in, with each of these players in this ecosystem. What is important for them? From a central bank perspective, what is important for them? Central bank would like to track cash, right? I mean, obviously they wanna make sure that the entire cash in the country's ecosystem, they have the full visibility end to end and they're able to track it for obvious reasons, for security, um, for uh, anti-money laundering purposes to make sure that you know, money is not laundered uh, or you know, spent in an illegal way. And central bank always wants to optimize the cash within that ecosystem. Central bank wants to introduce new policies to protect the cash, right? And um, you know, I was having breakfast uh, this morning and I know a couple of, couple of you came to me and I know there was an initial expectation set on uh, cryptocurrency, said, hey, can you cover something about cryptocurrency? I mean, I'll be honest, I'm not an expert in cryptocurrency, but I'll, I can talk a little bit about digital currencies backed by central banks. So one of the, one of the latest trend that you see from central banks are central bank backed digital currencies, right? So this is a new trend. Uh, this, is, uh, this is in study phase or pilot phase. This is done by the US Fed. This is done by the Europe. Uh, I was reading a, a latest report from New Zealand where they did a survey. So everybody is in that survey mode today and looking at introducing not a, a Bitcoin type of cryptocurrency, but a, a central bank backed cryptocurrency, which will be a one to one equivalent to a dollar or a euro. And um, when you did, when those studies were pretty interesting. So when people actually looked at that, those questionnaires, they said, you know what, we're all excited about it, but we don't want it to replace cash. So that was the number one response that people gave, that we don't want it to replace cash. So central bank is really kind of looking at that and saying, okay, if it doesn't replace cash, then it can complement cash, right? So that is what central banks are worried about and looking at. From a financial institutions, from the banks, retail banks, again, we have seen the trend in the past few years the number of bank branches have kind of gone down. The ATM networks have kind of increased or stayed the same, you know, depending on the different geographies that you look at. Um, there is a rise of collaboration between the banks. These banks are coming together and creating a, a utility model. It started in the Nordics, in Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Norway, with Bankomat, and then it kind of spread to the other countries in Europe. Um, in Netherlands, um, ABN AMRO, ING, and Rabobank came together and formed what they call as Gelmat. They said, you know what, we have a, a, an ABN AMRO uh, ATM and a, a Rabobank ATM and ING ATM right next to each other. Why do you need three ATMs? Why don't we pull it and have one ATM instead of three? So the banks came together and are doing an ATM pooling and a cash pooling. So collaboration of banks are happening within the banks, right? And this is actually spreading across other geographies as well. Banks are uh, focusing more on you know, advice versus the cash processing services. 
and the rising interest rate is not really helping, right? So interest rate, as the interest rate rises, banks are very much worried about how much cash is out there in the network. So these are, again, the, the, the different aspects that worries a financial institution. From a retailer perspective, um, there are increasing digital payments, so you need to have a digital infrastructure to manage all of those digital payments, but there is a rising cost of cash management as well. And this is because, as I said, and as the cash points gets reduced, the cash, the cost per cash point increases. Also, there is a shift in the labor market. I mean, the pandemic, that, that's what something that has showed us, that the labor market has shifted, the inflation has not helped. So hence, the, there's a, a rising cost in managing cash. And uh, the retailers, from a retailer perspective, cash flow is super important. So when we as consumers spend cash at a retailer, the biggest thing for a retailer is to get credit for that cash as quickly as possible. Now, traditionally what happens is a CIT company would go and pick up the cash from the retailer, take it back to the processing center, count it, and then inform the bank, this is the amount of money that was collected, and then the retailer gets the credit. Now, it may take between two days to two weeks for the retailer to get the credit for that cash, depending on when the CIT is scheduled to pick up at that uh, retail store. Now, if it is in a city environment, maybe the, the CIT is doing a, a pickup once every week or twice every week. If they're in a remote area, I mean, it's once every two weeks, right? So those are all some of the challenges that a retailer faces, you know, managing cash and trying to make cash as part of their ecosystem. And the last one of those in the ecosystem is the, the whole CIT company. Uh, again, the cash in transit, uh, this is the heart and soul of that whole cash ecosystem. They manage the supply chain. They replenish the ATMs. Uh, they replenish the banks, the branches, the retailers with cash. Uh, they collect the cash. They count the cash. They give the credit. And banks are increasingly becoming dependent on the CIT companies uh, to manage this ecosystem. It's a very complex environment, but CITs have the best overview in it. So again, I mean, we looked at the global trends. We looked at all the different players in this ecosystem and what is important for them, right? Now, let's see a little bit of industry disruption that is happening in the market. Again, trying to paint a picture for everyone of what is happening in the industry. Uh, just a few examples. There's a lot of disruption that is happening in the market. Now, you must have seen NCR buying Cartronics right, before. I mean, Cartronics is an ATM, uh, independent ATM deployer to really get into the space of managing, a, a, providing a managed services for cash in the market. Recently, NCR announced the split between their digital part and their, the cash and ATM part of their business, right? I know the market was not kind to that announcement, but again, that was the announcement that NCR made. Batopin is something in Belgium, like we, you know, we saw in uh, the, some parts of Europe, the tier one banks in Belgium have come together and formed uh, a consortium of banks in Belgium. Um, we see that in France as well. BNP Paribas and Société Générale and Credit Mutual are coming together again to form a consortium. So we see banks coming together. We see CITs coming together, Australia, where Armagard and Prosegur are the two largest CITs that own almost 100% of that market. And as they see a little bit decline in that a slide in the, uh, the cash, there is a merger conversation between Armagard and Prosegur. And with all of the consolidations and industry disruptions that are happening, Sesame was formed. Garda World launched Sesame earlier this year. So that's the part I'm going to just quickly introduce about three to four slides on Sesame, what Sesame is all about. Sesame is the combination of Garda World Cash, uh, which is a, a leader in North America in cash services and much more. Um, Gunebo Cash Management, which is a leader in Europe for cash management services in Europe and Africa. Plan Focus, which is a leader in AI-based cash forecasting. So all of the supply chain of cash management and cash forecasting. Tidal, which is a, a North American leader in all of the smart safes, recyclers, and all of the intelligent devices. So just you know, for a reference, 
A smart safe is a safe that sits in a retail store where when the cashier goes and collects the money at the end of the day, they can deposit that money in that safe. And the safe actually counts the money, does the, all, all the end of day processing, and also communicates to a software platform how much money has been deposited in, the, in that machine, in that safe. And Arca is one of our latest announcement where Arca is a, a number two player in Teller Cash Recycler, okay, in the banking branch. So the five companies coming together is what formed Sesame. Uh, it is powered by the software, the intelligent devices, like I said, I mean, it is the smart safes, it's the recyclers, it is the locker systems. So when you look at small businesses, small businesses who want to have, you know, cash in their ecosystem, uh, want to deposit that cash in a bank branch, but don't want to do it during the banking hours, they can actually go to a bank that has a locker system created by Sesame where they can go and deposit their cash in a night depository. And if they want to order a, an emergency cash or emergency coins, they can actually order the cash. They cannot afford a CIT to deliver that cash on a day-to-day -day basis. CITs will deliver it in the locker system and you can send somebody from the small business, go to the locker system, grab the cash and bring to your retail. So those are all the intelligent devices that we have and surrounded by the managed services around it. Okay, um, just a global footprint. I mean, if you're a $1.4 billion company uh, operating in about six continents, over uh, in plus 70 plus countries, 350,000 plus uh, intelligent devices are deployed. And I lead a team of about 250 R&D professionals who are always working on trying to see how to make you know, innovation, how to make cash more and more affordable for our customers, banks and retailers and central bank. Just the software platform that we have created that, that you, know, uh, you know, this is a little bit of complex eye chart, but just a quick explanation. Uh, at the bottom of that chart, you will see all of the devices. The devices are connected through an intelligent device manager into the platform. And what is interesting is, like I said, the, the biggest challenge for a retailer is getting that pre-credit or the provisional credit of that money that gets deposited by the uh, customer at a, at a retail store. So what this platform actually enables is the, the cash, as it comes into the safe, the platform is able to recognize that money. And at the end of the day, it has a, plat it has a, a way to communicate to the banking environment saying, yep, this retailer, uh, Loblaw or a Walmart store has X number of dollars at the end of the day in that safe, then the bank can provide that provisional credit to the retailer on a same day basis. Right? So that's all of the financial monitoring. Uh, from a technical monitoring perspective, trying to keep all of the machines with the highest availability possible. It has the forecasting tool to make sure that you know, we have an accurate forecasting of cash out there in the market. And all of the customers from central bank to banks to retailers and various personas of customers are able to log into the platform on the top, as you can see that on the top, uh, they can log into the, 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 to the platform and see the entire ecosystem of cash. So the software platform provides an end-to-end, -end, fully integrated uh, cash ecosystem management software. It's a SaaS platform, it's hosted on the cloud and people, uh, customers subscribe to the platform. All right, enough said about you know, the Sesame platform. Let's get back to you know, the future of cash. Now, this is the last topic and I'll close with this. What is the future of cash? Right? Uh, what, what do we think, think is you know, gonna happen? Uh, where is the industry headed? Now, as we said, you know, from a banking perspective, from bank branches are getting reduced. There's a, the footprint of banks going down. The number of ATMs increase, decreasing you know, based on the, the geographies that you're in. But did you know that there are over a million post offices in the world? Right? There are over a million post offices. That's an interesting fact. And uh, these post offices are not just in the cities, but in every part of the geography. It's in the rural areas and in the cities. And what is happening? We see a trend of banks using post offices as a means to provide cash services to the end customer. Uh, I just posted in here what UK post office is doing. The UK post office has been providing 
cash services or banking services, uh, selected banking services to the customers in UK for the past at least a few years. Now they are piloting uh, 13 new kind of post offices that where they can provide more and more additional banking services within the post offices. And this is happening in several parts of the world. Uh, banks are get, you know, having the post office to provide banking services, okay? Let's look at another example, uh, Lyft. Uh, integration of cash in an e-commerce ecosystem. As you know, I mean, Uber and Lyft, they always accept cards, right? But now, I mean, like Uber, Lyft has also said, okay, we will accept cash. But how do you accept cash? I mean, they don't want to have the physical cash uh, to be given to the driver. So what they have come up with is converting cash and digitizing that cash. What do I mean by that? They have you know, certain uh, stalls or top-up centers where you can purchase a card and top up the card with cash and then take that card as you use Lyft. So that's something that is, you know, uh, retailers are exploring. The other way to do it is, you know, uh, now we all, I know we all shop e-commerce, right? I mean, Amazon or any other e-commerce, e and we all spend money, digital money. But what if you can, you know, you are a part of that underbanked or unbanked population, but you still want to shop e-commerce, you still, still want to buy from Amazon, what do you do, right? So I, what I see the trend is that retailers are trying to figure out a way for people to pay in cash for, a, for an online purchase through a voucher, through a barcode that can be generated as they do the online transaction. And uh, you can take that barcode and a voucher to a, a affiliate retail partner and you pay in cash, right? So that's how you, know, you are trying to merge the use of cash and the digitization in that e-commerce. Uh, that's a trend. Now, another one that I see is very interesting is, I know um, some of you must have heard what SEPA is, is the single you know, European payment area which is a, a instant payment across the Eurozone. So Europe, I mean, this is widely adopted um, where you can do person to pay, person payments, instant transfer. This is a separate rail than the credit card or debit card rails where you can do the instant transfer of money. Now, Fido is an organization in uh, Italy which has now kind of taken this a step further. And Fido is actually powered by the Sesame platform. And Fido said, you know what? Why don't we use the SEP up uh, the rails to actually provide instant credit to the retailer as the retailer gets that cash? So that is super interesting, right? So Fido is actually working with the Central Bank of Italy to uh, get on this platform and they're piloting this in Italy as we speak. And there are a few stores that are on it where as soon as we as consumers go and spend money in Italy, they're able to get that instant credit for that cash uh, through the SEPA rails. Uh, that's Fido. And one more I would say is, you know, a plan focus again, this is Sesame Company, AI-based forecasting. As I was saying, you know, uh, the cost of cash has really risen in the past uh, several months, especially with the inflation and the interest rates, rates going up. In the past, actually, it didn't really matter how much cash was sitting out there in an ATM or a, a bank branch or in a vault, but now banks are increasingly getting conscious of that because of the cost of cash. So there are AI-based tools now to accurately forecast how much cash is needed in that whole ecosystem. Because from a bank perspective, you don't want too little cash uh, where you run out of cash in the ATM, or you don't want too much cash where you're losing the opportunity cost on that cash, right? So you want just about the right level of cash in your bank branches, in your ATMs, on your retail outlets, and there are AI-based tools to actually predict the use of cash. Okay, which brings to my kind of last slide, if I can go back, sorry, press too much. All right. So I want to uh, end with a quote from um, Hank Esselink, who is from the European Central Bank. And uh, he says, there is a future of cash, but how bright it will be depends on whether we are able to keep it convenient, efficient, and safe. Thank you very much.
I have a few more minutes, so I'm happy to take some questions. It seems to me that largely a cash economy is a avoiding tax economy. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Uh, sure. So from, from uh, spending cash, maybe I'm not the, uh, the expert on the tax economy, I'm sorry. <laughs> the unbanked. Yeah, sure. Uh, so to help uh, from uh, trying to evade the taxes, trying to manage, uh, avoid the taxes, yes, that is part of the problem that we're trying to solve as well, right? I mean, from a central bank, from a financial institution, uh, that is a major concern. So how do you manage, how do you digitize that cash in the ecosystem? Right? So that has been something being discussed, uh, trying to see how do you, include, you want to have the social inclusion to ensure that those people are included in the cash, but at the same time trying to make sure that they don't evade cash. Like for example, I mean, you go to certain parts of Eastern Europe, they prefer cash when you, you're in a cab. Why do they do that? Because they want to avoid the taxes, uh, tax, taxes right? But again, uh, how do you merge the two? That is a challenge. I mean, it is something that is openly discussed, but you, know, you cannot avoid one or the other, unfortunately. Yeah. A good point, though. My company is a global is a uh, federally based uh, licensed MSB business based in Toronto, but our business tend to be more global sense in our transactions. And I'm just curious to know about uh, how Sesame and its networks would actually be able to uh, integrate the existing uh, uh, operators in this business into your ecosystem. Uh, sure. So Sesame is a global company. Uh, we have built a platform that actually spans across the globe, across multiple economies, right? So we build a platform that spans across North America, Europe. We have presence in Asia, in Australia, in Brazil, in South America. Uh, we are connected with central, I mean, the several banks in the back end in Europe. So Europe has a standard format, like a PAIN, P -A -I -N, PAIN format, where we can connect to all of the banks in Europe. In US and North America, it's slightly different because every bank has their own core banking system, which is slightly different. Again, we have built integrations into ACI based 24 switches to Pfizer switches. So from a connectivity perspective into all of the large economies, we are able to provide that service. So does that mean there's a opportunity for companies like the, the existing companies like myself that would be able to contact and, and be, be able to partnership up with uh, the Sesame operations? Absolutely, yes. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I give you some time back. Thank you very much.